Christopher Columbus came upon this island on November the 3rd, 1493. It was a Sunday, so he called it Dominica for the Lord. Devil Mountain near the Valley of Desolation, place names which bear witness to what its people have been through. A choir made up of the sons and daughters of plantation workers, people who work the bananas and coconuts on one of the biggest plantations, the plantation owned by Robert Douglas, the man everyone calls RBD. RBD named his second son, Roosevelt, for the president. The kids he takes down to the beach call him Rosie. Montreal, Sir George Williams University, February 1969. Rosie, a Sir George graduate on a master's at McGill, helps organize a computer center sit-in. Rosie is 36 now. Every Sunday morning, he can be found under the almond tree at the beach at Portsmouth. Tension builds as the occupation at Sir George continues. Rosie contacts John Diefenbaker. Well, I phoned Diefenbaker because... Uh, the former prime minister had helped Rosie get into Canada to study. Rosie reciprocated by working for the Diefenbaker Tories. Now Diefenbaker advises the university to let them freeze in the dark. If the students occupied any section of the building during winter, they should turn the heat off and let them freeze to death. Fire hoses drove police back when they charged the barricades. All hell broke loose inside. A handful of the 97 occupiers, Rosie not among them, set fire to the computer and scattered its cards across two city blocks. Two million dollars damage, Canada's most expensive student riot. Rosie lost 65 pounds in a Canadian jail. He served a year and a half. Out of prison, Rosie was a changed, if not chastened man, but the RCMP regarded him as dangerous and in 1976 had him deported. Well, I go back to Dominica, the island I was born, and uh, the thing is, my life will always be threatened there because of the barbaric kind of laws, the, the almost medieval laws, which have been passed in Dominica. The Douglas Plantation. Back home, Rosie's life was not in danger, but his father's peace of mind was. R.B. Douglas locks up the coconut factory, and Rosie is on his mind. Mr. Douglas sent Rosie to Ontario's Guelph University to get a degree in agriculture. Rosie got the degree, but came back and organized his father's workers into a union. Having gone $6,000 in debt to pay some of Rosie's legal expenses, Mr. Douglas was not amused. He cleared $30,000 last year, but with 26 children, it doesn't go very far. But his plantation does go far, stretching all the way to the Caribbean Sea. Rosie, we're here right in the middle of your father's estate. There's acres of bananas and coconut. What would you do if, if he were able to leave it to you? Would you give it away to the workers? Well, I wouldn't give it away, but I would try to develop it in a manner which would allow the workers on the estate to enjoy a decent standard of living. Bananas are the problem, and Rosie says he has solutions. The island is locked into a one-crop economy, selling all to a big British banana corporation. The small grower earns six cents a pound, or less than two dollars, for a 35-pound bunch. He may have to tote them two miles through a rainforest before coming to a road, where likely as not he must pay someone else to truck them to market. Dominica is an associate state, soon to be independent from Britain. What she is in reality is a banana republic. The situation is ripe for radicalism, and in a place called Grand Bay, the drums beat out a song against the CIA. Here, the most successful slave uprisings occurred, and recently, a plantation owner was burned out. Because of its radical tradition, Rosie made his headquarters in Grand Bay. With moral support from the Cuban government, Rosie is organizing hard around gut issues, setting up a canning cooperative and a literacy project. He's also trying to get Canadian aid money to build a road and buy a truck for remote banana growers. That road constructed, they're in deep trouble. I mean, what are the chances from your experience as minister? The fact that Rosie stands to the left of his brother Michael means trouble for Michael, eldest of the Douglas sons, and member of parliament representing the family seat, Portsmouth. is concerned the road program. The marketplace at Portsmouth on a Saturday is a hive of activity as people flock here to buy fresh provisions like mangoes and breadfruit. The Douglas family dominates here as they do everywhere else in Portsmouth. They have the store next door to the marketplace where they sell canned goods and liquor. The marketplace is in Michael Douglas's constituency. So like any good politician, Michael Douglas knows that market day is the day to make political hay. I don't think at this time Rosie holding the philosophies that he does that he could be part of a political party that I am in. He would have to move a lot more towards the center. And I don't see him doing that. <laughs> what helps Rosie run are checks, like the $100 he gets every month from a sympathetic Saskatchewan doctor. 
Rosie saves money by living at home, even though his father sent him a lawyer's letter ordering him out after Rosie organized the Douglas workers. The family's Easter picnic was Mr. Douglas' first afternoon off in years. He's 72. Grandson of a freed slave, at 23 he made $1 a day and somehow saved $700 in two years. He bought land and never looked back. He was elected twice to the legislature, telling constituents, I give you a job on my estate, credit at my store, a dress for a christening, and a coffin when you die. All I ask is that you vote for me. All 16 children finished high school. Six have university degrees. Many are away. Eisenhower working on a master's in Connecticut, Adenauer studying business in New York, Marina learning management in West Germany, and McIntyre finishing an MBA in England. What do you think of Rosie's politics? Well, uh, I, I don't agree with it. Frankly, I don't agree with it at all. I mean, to me, uh, he could have done better. Of all his talented children, he feels not one is worthy of succeeding him. Michael, the eldest. All of us at one time or another, all of us, at 16 of us in the family, have worked with the old man from time to time, in one form or another, either on the estate or in building the cinema or on the farm or in the business, what have we. And we've all tended to stray away. Uh, my mother's that link, that constant link that keeps us linked to the family inextricably. Were things very difficult for you? Oh, very difficult in the beginning. You know, things were hard. But, you know, working all the time, making children are working all the time. What do you think about the way your, your kids have turned oh, out? Oh. Michael, who was a cabinet minister, and Rosie, who was in jail in Canada. Yes, I was very much depressed. Why? Without him, he's in jail. I mean, it must make you feel bad, eh? Did you feel disgraced? Or? No, I didn't feel disgraced. I was feeling bad, really bad. Crying all the time, sometimes by myself. And I go to church, I pray a lot, and ask God for strength, I pray for him. And this, all these years, I was feeling very, very bad, much depressed, you know? How do you feel now that he's back in Dominica? Well, I still feel very proud, but still I find he has no real job. He's just, you know, moving about in his politics, I find. You're worried that he's not settled down? Yeah. What kind of father was your husband to the boys? How do you feel he... He was very hard. Hard. No, he wasn't joking with them at all. Very hard. Hard in what way? Yeah, they, well, they had to do their work, whatever he asked them to do, learn their lessons, and if they behave badly, he used to beat them with a rope. From eight in the morning till eight at night, you can find her in the family store, sometimes wondering about her husband's wandering. Take life as God give it. And my husband always pray a lot. I know that your husband has ten children outside your marriage. How do you feel about the children, and how did you feel at the time when they were being born? I still feel very bad. Is it ten? I don't think there are so many outside. Did you ever feel jealous? No, I never feel jealous. I just don't worry that at all. <laughs> I don't feel, but I just feel bad. I mean. You're married, and I find it's just a bad example for his own children coming up. Just pray that God will make him leave that person. Well, sooner or later, he leaves that person, but he gets another one, and he keeps on <laughs> At the banana packing plant, the last load from the countryside is being washed and boxed for shipment. The manager is one of dozens of Dominicans Rosie arranged to visit Cuba to see socialism firsthand. For a while, Rosie's Cuban junkets, arranged and paid for by the Cuban Foreign Ministry, became so popular, even the Premier's wife went along. But with independence coming for the island, the governing Labour Party was wary of appearing too leftist. The Premier also had a problem with Rosie's brother Michael, a rising star in the Cabinet, openly challenging the Premier's leadership. So the Premier solved both problems by firing Michael from the Cabinet, using Rosie's politics as an excuse. Mr. Christian, you're Deputy Premier, but also you're the Minister in charge of Education, Youth and Cooperatives. Can you tell me what the government has done? The Deputy Premier relishes the split in the Douglas family. Rusey Douglas is a socialist, and he and his father are at variance, dangerously so, so much so that his father has told me to be wary of his son because he's an international opportunist. Do you think that Rosie Douglas and his brother Michael Douglas were actually involved in revolutionary activities here? That is exactly what precipitated 
the dismissal of his brother. As a matter of fact, when I heard of the Premier's remark that there was a, a communist plot to overthrow the government by force, our organization, the Dominica Cuba Friendship Association, wrote a letter to the Premier telling him, in fact, that we are concerned about his allegations and that if such a plot does exist in the country, those involved in it are bordering on conspiring to commit treason and they must be arrested and charged for treason. And he has not arrested anybody and charged him with treason yet. Rosie Douglas to the people of Dominica is like pointing a red rag before a bull. And that is the... But among the young people, he has made certain strides. <laughs> In the spirit of reggae, the beat springs from the island's French patois. The music is spelled cadence and called cadaz. Dominica lies between the French islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe, so the cadaz sound is even catching on in France. This is Gramax, the number one group, and they like Rosie. This is the kind of band he likes for his bandwagon. Sometimes their songs are as apolitical as a coconut, but sometimes they call for revolution against measures like the coconut law, which punishes the stealing of even a single coconut with up to a year in the island's steamy prison. Reformers have been making promises in Dominica for centuries, but every Friday, boxes with the Geist Banana Company label on them are loaded for shipment as they've always been loaded, on the backs and heads of some 200 women. From the warehouse a hundred yards down the Geist Pier, where the bananas are ferried out to the Geist Star, the company's white freighter. Every 35-pound box of bananas earns a tally from the tally man, a tally worth two cents. Young women with strong legs and good backs can earn $7 in a day. For many, that's a week's pay. Do you want to bring the old society tumbling down like this fort? Well, in a sense, I mean, what this represents really is a period of our history um, that we would like to, to change and, and upon these ruins really to build a new society that is able to provide for the people a decent living standard. When you talk about ruins, you're really talking about some kind of violence? Violence only comes when everything else fails. I believe that um, we will be able to go through a peaceful uh, transition in Dominica. The sacking at Sir George was supposed to trigger a revolution in Dominica, according to RCMP informer Warren Hart. Warren Hart said that revolution was due to start here after the execution of two officials from Sir George. Was that true? Who well, made that, not to the best of my knowledge, I mean, there was no revolution planned. You don't plan revolution from outside the country in the first place. Warren had came into the black community and we met him. And um, at the time, there were a number of black people in the United States that were running away from persecution. And we always greeted them with an open heart. Maybe we were naive. And if we were naive, I mean, I accept the blame for it. Capitalism has served you very well. You're the son of one of the richest people in Portsmouth. You're a child of what you would call a bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I always, sometimes when I speak to the workers, you know, on my father's estate, that question always comes up. The question is, I mean, uh, is the dog wagging the tail or the tail wagging That's the right. dog? So my father really had to struggle against tremendous odds to be able to get to where he has gotten. Um, but he was able to get to where he got because um, there was an abundance of cheap labor as well. And um, by virtue of utilizing that cheap labor, he was able to accumulate enough at least to get his own children an education. So while I have a responsibility to him as my father and my family, who I, I try to always give the utmost respect, I also have a responsibility to the workers who produce that wealth, in fact, to enable me to get an education and to hope that one day that their children will get the same opportunity and more than I was able to get. At a pier not far from the Douglas home, the bananas are loaded into the night. Michael Douglas, as MP for the area and son of RBD, has exercised his privilege and gone out to drink cold draft ale in the officer's mess aboard the Geist banana boat. Michael is a good politician who would like to be prime minister, but he likes the good life that comes from the traditional way of doing things. When Michael Douglas was called a communist, he said, I'm not a communist, I'm a Catholic, and laid the matter to rest. It's Easter on the island, and thousands as Catholic as mother and father Douglas recreate the way of the cross. 
the white priest and hymns of glorification, the rituals that help the church play its part in maintaining the old order. Rosie is one Douglas who's put his faith in other gods. Rosie wants many things for his island. He'd like to see tourists, a piano for the choir, and more Canadian aid. He acknowledges his debt to Canada. Guelph gave him a degree in agriculture he uses to good advantage in his organizing. Sir George gave him a political science degree and a lesson on political violence. Canada's prisons taught him how to survive in a jungle. With it all, Rosie would like to lead a revolution. But right now, it's Saturday night, and his Montreal Canadians are playing the Washington Capitals. He won't get to sleep until he finds out who won.